uh, since we're doing a documentary focusing on male victims of domestic violence and uh, sexual assault, I would like to know what are your opinions about these uh, remarks, you know, those man up remarks, you know, you're, you're supposed to be a man, deal with it, you, this generally doesn't happen, get over it. What are your opinions on those? Um, my opinion is that they, they come from a society that's very, um, uh, that's very, that's, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess it's, um, sexist, I guess, because uh, because we have these gender roles that are attached to, um, the sexes, um, um, predominantly two sexes, even though there, there are more. And and I and I think it's very sexist. I think um, it's it it's, it supposes that that only women are the are the weaker sex, and that women um, are, are, should be the ones complaining about um, domestic abuse and uh, and and um, and sexual assault, whereas men ought not to complain about these things um, because because the, cause the stereotypes um, put on to men are such that men are are. Are stronger and, sub and somehow stronger means um, not not able to succumb to uh, or not to be not not to be victimized by sexual assault or or, or domestic abuse. That boys and men face a lot of pressure to be a real man. But what exactly it means to be a real man? Uh, Start with men. You know, entirely. We don't clear. want to see men as that. being vulnerable. But I knew that I would struggled with anxiety and depression and a lot of challenges and I, I kind of thought that a lot of that was no, they, you know, just part it, of... It's just not part of the conversation of that boys are um, vulnerable to, to perpetrators. I think that uh, um, there's, a, there's a kind of stigma in terms of domestic violence when it comes to, to males as opposed to women. Uh, you know, of course, uh, women go through this all the time, but the guys do too. But the thing is that guys are a lot more quiet about it, I would suppose. Uh, they're not necessarily more as open to, to sharing their domestic violence experiences as, say, women would. Boys and men face a lot of pressure to be a real man. But what exactly it means to be a real man isn't entirely clear. Like, we know that guys are supposed to be tough. And we have this legacy that guys aren't supposed to act like girls. And depending on where you are in the U.S. or in other places in the world, that maybe guys shouldn't be gay. That that's not really okay for a guy to be. Um, but it's always a little nebulous exactly what it is to be a real man. And so one of the things that we see is that guys constantly have to prove their manhood or defend their, their kind of masculine cred or their masculine status? I, I think that there's a whole lot of uh, expectations on men to be that strong, stoic uh, stoic man, you know, that, that we don't want to see men as being vulnerable or men hurting. Uh, part of that has come about through, um, you know, the rise of, of women who see things you know very much through their perspective and they're not at all looking at things from from you know a man's perspective and and what he may be going through and i think there's a lot of um dismissal of the impact on that on men and you know i think overall we're missing a whole lot of uh the picture when it comes to gender relations but certainly when it comes to uh, providing services for men to um, to be able to heal and to move on from some of the things that have happened to them, uh, you know, just just because men are men doesn't mean that they don't uh, that they don't need help. Well, ever since this became a prevalent problem, um, I think that uh, I think that, that that rape is looked at as a an atrocity that's committed upon women. Um, more so than, than males, unless you like toss in the whole jail thing, you know, like uh, guys get raped in jail all the time type of thing. Um, but I think that as a as a culture, we're more actually we're more focused on women. I feel I, I feel like uh, I, I feel like um, society doesn't think that that ma um, that male sexual assault exists. 
um, um, unless it's in prison, and and I f and and even then it's not talked about, and and there, are, and and men aren't encouraged to talk about it, um, and I feel like as far as uh, domestic abuse goes, for um, when when men are at the receiving end of domestic abuse, they're told to man up or to fight back or. You know, or, or or made to feel less than a man for complaining about it, or for you know saying something about it. I I had a very strong sense that men were being unheard, especially when they were victims of, uh, you know, either domestic violence uh, or sexual abuse, or, you know, it was the whole perception that men were so stoic and strong, and yet I saw a lot of men around me struggling greatly and not being able to. Um, sort of freely articulate the way they felt. And I saw a lot of relationship breakdown uh, due to that, uh, including my own, you know, my own, uh, my own marriage suffered in part due to some of those, uh, due to some of those reasons. And so I was kind of drawn to helping men because I wanted to, um, I wanted to, you know, show them some empathy and, and, um, and let them know that they, that they were being heard and that they were being seen probably as well, that it wasn't, um, you know, men's struggles weren't going unnoticed. Uh, you know, I am first and foremost uh, a survivor uh, of sexual abuse and also multiple other forms of trauma uh, and abuse that occurred mostly uh, in my childhood. Uh, but I really only came to learn of their impact and how they were affecting me much later on in life. Um, and it wasn't until I was already well into my 30s um, and thought that I had sort of done a lot of things that you're supposed to do to sort of have a normal life and gotten out of all of that bad stuff um, before I really started to understand and realize that there's, there's a, the story really is a lot more complicated. Uh, and, I, and as I was doing more work sort of for my own healing, I started to realize how much of a need there was for uh, other voices uh, of survivors, and especially for male survivors, uh, especially male survivors of sexual abuse, to come forward and to, to be public and to speak openly uh, about not just our experiences, but you know the work of healing and the work that we can do to support and help one another. When we're talking about boys who've been sexually abused or raped, is that it often makes them question if they're real enough. Are they man enough or macho? Because they wonder, like, should they have been able to fight off this attacker? Which is a common question that survivors of all genders have, but in some ways, or at least for some guys, all the more so because guys are taught that they should defend themselves and they should always be able to defend themselves. Um, so there's some additional pressure that guys face about, did I do something wrong? So it's my fault that I got assaulted or raped. Um, and that can create some additional stigma beyond the kind of regular stigma uh, that a lot of survivors face. You know, I thought I was more or less a normally functioning adult for most of my life up before that, but I knew that I'd struggled with anxiety and depression and a lot of challenges and I, I kind of thought that a lot of that was you know just part of maybe just a part of who who I was or what I was I, I hadn't quite connected the dots um, to a lot of the traumatic experiences I had, had early on in life uh, and understood that there is a that, you know I, I got somewhere that there was a link but I, I didn't really understand how powerful a link it was and how understanding and connecting those dots would unlock a path to healing uh, that previously I, I didn't even know really existed. Our culture has a, we have this thing where we, you know, like we place women on, ped, uh, we, we elevate women into a, in a pedestal position, you know, and um, we don't, guys don't necessarily like to be the victim per se and so you know like uh everything that we put out there in terms of uh awareness about this uh this issue and also uh everything that basically that 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 we condition ourselves to believe is that you know is, is women's that are women that are the the victims and not us 
not us guys. But I think that that's a, I think that's a, I think that's something that's actually put out there by the male gender, actually. Okay. Um, you did mention that you were a victim of domestic violence. Do yes. you want to, are you comfortable sharing a little bit more? How did you get out of that situation? If you did... I never got out of it. <laughs> I stood in, I stood in up until the relationship ran its course and just completely fell apart. I figured I was the, I was the victim and also at the end I was the heartbroken one, which is the funny part, you know. I think that a lot of people um, who are victimized in terms of domestic violence, um, they have this kind of like undying loyalty to the person who's actually victimizing that. You know, and I can kind of I can kind of attribute that to kind of like uh, what hostages go through in terms of their kidnappers and actually starting to relate and feel very close to. The Stockholm syndrome. Yes. Um, yeah, he he needed to be medicated, but when and um, and when he would not use his medication, he would drink, and when he would drink, um, he would usually get aggressive, and he would usually end up hitting me, and I did not, and 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 honestly, we only stayed together for five months, but that was. That was like the main reason why I decided to break it off with him because because of that, and um, but I didn't report. I never reported him because I loved him and you know and I and I still like him, you know. Um, I I still think fondly of him. Oddly enough, you know. And and the second time, um, the 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 <laughs> which is weird. The second time, um, I didn't, I I, I didn't. Um, I didn't report him the second the, the second time it happened with the second guy, be, uh, and this is weird, but because he didn't hit me as hard as the first as, as the first guy did, so I didn't think it was I was like oh this guy you know it felt like the way, and I hate to say it but it, it felt like the way uh, a weak girl would hit you, you know when 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 they were like oh stop it stop it but but and and I realized that it that that I realized later. That it what that that's not that that wasn't the point. It was the intention behind the the physicality, which was which was negative. Which was, you know, I'm going to, I'm trying to make you submit to me by physically hurting you, you know, or by or or, or, or by physically you know, hitting you, you know, and that's what that was what his attempt intention was, and that's what, and and I didn't I didn't pick up on it um, later, and but and how I got out of that relationship was actually I hit him back and and I I actually choked him out and and then the police were called and I actually went to jail for six days and and I and um and uh and that's how I and then we got a court order to to break up and that's how I actually broke up with him um otherwise it probably would I uh, probably never would have broken up with him the person who I was with was actually a, a very hands-on kind of person uh very uh, so uh physical she she was she's she was a very physical person throughout her entire life you know she got into a lot of fights growing up and so violence was like a part of her life you know uh even outside of uh relationships and i didn't start right away but um i actually she had history of domestic violence with her prior exes and believe it or not uh, I loved her so much that I was waiting for that point of our relationship to get to that point. Believe it or not, yeah. To get to what point? The Did domestic violence. Yeah, I, I I loved her so much that I was like, okay, if you loved me as much as you loved this other person, how come you're not abusing me the way you abused them? Was it because you don't love me as much or something like that? Yeah, I know that sounds really weird, but. Does she come from like an abusive household? No, not necessarily. No, I mean, you know, typical Spanish family, you know, you know, get the chunk that the cochea, you know, every now and then, but nothing that would uh, indicate like real abuse, you know, just just discipline. How long did that relationship last? Four years. Okay. He was extremely verbally abusive towards me. He was extremely verbally abusive. Um, he was it, he was emotionally abusive too. Um, but and, and he would once in a while become physically abusive, um, but but again his the the physical abuse was nowhere near as bad as the emotional and the verbal abuse was, um, and and I and again I think that's why probably I never reported it because because um, the physical abuse was not as bad as the first guy, and um, and the physical abuse was not as bad as 
as the emotional and the verbal. Uh, my relationship with this girl was uh, extremely intricate and complex. Um, we were best friends for many, many years prior to actually getting into the relationship. Um, so, yes, of course, she was already placed on a pedestal, at least in my eyes and in others' eyes. But um, that wasn't necessarily as, that was necessarily the reason why I, uh, I was expecting this to happen or waiting for it to happen. Or accepting it. Or uh, it wasn't even, yeah, uh, the whole acceptance factor just came from the simple fact that I genuinely loved her great, greatly and deeply, so. Is it okay if I... Yeah, that's fine. Um, did you ever talk to anyone about this? No, people would just know because, uh, you know, <laughs> I'd show up with like a cut next to my eye or something. I actually have two scars right here on mm -hmm. uh, I would just uh, get into situations and people would, um, you know, they would just know already, like, oh, you got into it with her again, didn't you? And, you know, I wouldn't necessarily confirm them, uh, confirm their accusations, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't deny it either, you know, because it was kind of a given. You know? really, what would you advise men who are in an abusive relationship, regardless of, this, of the gender of their partner? Um... I would say, I mean, it's, it's hard to, uh, having, having, again, having been in that relationship, you got, you got to break, you got to break it off. You have to break it off because, uh, and, and unfortunately my, my barometer for, 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 for physical abuse is our, our, our lifetime television movies and in the, and it always just gets worse. It never gets better. It, it, you know the physical abuse thing it always gets worse and I would say get out of it um, as soon as possible in your opinion what do you think we should start changing well um, uh, as a gay man myself and part of the LGBT community I one of the things that I that I always felt is that the LGBT community well has has always been on the forefront of, of, of what society can be and one of the things that I love about the LGBT community is is how um, gender is being challenged and being redefined um, continuously um, in the LGBT community. And um, and and I and I hate to put make this analogy, but just like how how society looks at what that what, what gay people are doing were wearing five years ago to to realize what to wear now, I think that that's what we're going to be doing. 10 or 15 years from now, looking at what the LGBT community is doing now in terms of, of, of gender identification um, and, and, and learning from that. And, and, I think, and I think that, that first of all, I think that there are many, many, many ways to be. And that, um, that so society is too myopic in that we think that there's just, you know, the, 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 the male gender role and the female gender role and that you have to pick one you have to fit yourself into one of those roles otherwise you know you're you're messed up or, or in some in some way or shape or form and and i and i think it's that it's that false dichotomy that's been messing people up comparing to that previous relationship and that time in your life how would you consider your relationships now and your attitude towards that big, that type of victim well, I would not a hundred percent would not put myself in that situation ever again. Um, and if I and if I found myself in that situation, I'd be running for the hills. Honestly, I, I wouldn't want to undergo that kind of volatile relationship again with anybody. Um, uh, I definitely learned from that relationship in a sense of what I wanted for myself, you know, and also what I wanted to um, actually uh, uh, how you say. Um, what I wanted my daughter to be around, you know? So I didn't want her to be seen anything like this. So of course, I'm not gonna make the same mistakes that I made, you know, while younger. And just generally, I just can't, I, I can't see myself ever loving somebody to the point where I did like the way I did this girl and allowing myself to be blinded by a love and allowing myself to actually you know, uh, become a victim. I, I can't stress the fact that I, you know, I've, I've been, I can't stress it enough that the fact that I've actually experienced this, friends, family members, 
um, who have actually undergone uh, this kind of stuff. And, you know, and I've always told them, listen, like, this is not healthy. This is something that, you know, you should not subject yourself to in any kind of way. You know, like, uh, it's, it's, it's not a healthy love. You know, you might love somebody deeply, but, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a complete love. It's not a real love that, 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 you know, that is meant to lift you up as opposed to putting you down. But what happens when men speak up uh, about this kind of abuse, they are told to man up, you know, toughen up and take it or leave or do this or do that. Um, but, of course, you know, it's, we know from, from all victims' experiences, from, from women and from men, it's not so easy to just leave, especially when there's children involved. Um, and in many cases uh, here in relation to domestic violence where the man is the victim of, of ongoing abuse, severe abuse um, and often violence, uh, when they leave, they they have to leave their children with the perpetrator because um, the, the everything is is pretty much favoured in the in the woman's realm. So it's the, it's it, it all comes down to that one common theme that that um, we must protect women, but men must protect themselves. You know, men are men are responsible for their own outcomes, but but women aren't. And I think, you know, if we, if we wanted to start to talk about um, victim blaming, I think, you know, we've only got to look at male victims of, of domestic violence or sexual abuse and, and we see it repeatedly. A lot of the men that disclose to me are doing it for the very first time. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, in many cases they only have to see uh, a level of empathy, as I said earlier, uh, and, and gain some trust. So the conversations always sort of start out kind of talking about something else uh, and then they, they will lead into that. So they're sort of building trust first. Um, and generally what they tell me is, you know, in, in many cases the, you know, the event might have occurred, you know, 50 years earlier uh, or 40 years earlier. It may have occurred in their childhood and they're well into their adult or, you know, getting into their sort of senior years um, at the time that they disclose. And in many cases, uh, you know, they'll just tell me that they um, they just put it away. They just, you know, they didn't want to have to deal with the pain. Uh, when we're talking about sexual abuse, uh, especially where the um, they've been their perpetrator has been another male, they have a lot of confusion and and confliction over that. And in society, you know, we're, we're at the moment we're constantly demonising men for um, for their masculinity. And when a man has been a victim of another man, this creates a whole um, internal conflict for him in how, um, you know, how he feels about his own masculinity and how he feels about his own identity and identification when, you know, he's being told that all men are bad uh, and yet he was a victim of, of a bad man or a bad act. And, uh, and, you know, yet he can't talk about that because there's no room for men to be vulnerable. If, uh, if men and women are mostly equal, mm -hmm. can men be victims of domestic violence? Oh, yes. And can they be victims of, of rape? They can be victims of both. Okay. Yeah. Do you think men can be victims of domestic violence? Sure. Okay. Do you think men can be victims of rape? You see, based on what is like socially, you know, believe, that's not happening, that, that cannot happen, but you have tons of men that can be, you know, like really shy and and a woman or a man can rape them. It's I definitely do think that men can be um, victims of domestic violence. Okay, great. Now, uh, surprise question is, do you think men can be victims of rape? You mean like legally or just like my personal opinion? Your personal opinion. Um, can they be victims of rape? I mean, I think if, 
I don't think I don't think they can be raped. No? No. Okay. The thing that I think really trans that helped me connect the dots was connecting with other survivors of sexual abuse. And one of the things that I had sort of gone through most of my life dealing with was trying to put together, I I'd focused a lot in my 20s on trying to put together pieces from having lived with very you know challenging parents, it was a very dysfunctional household, um, and sort of had processed and talked a lot about those kinds of issues with therapists and friends and other people. But I never talked about the sexual abuse that had happened to me, uh, that was done to me, excuse me, uh, when I was about eight to 10 years old. And, you know, looking back, it, I realize now that part of what I did was minimize those memories and those experiences, which is a very common thing for a lot of male survivors to do. Um, and within the context of all of these other things that were going on around me that I grew up having to deal with, the sexual abuse never seemed like that big a deal, so I never really talked that much about it. And when I got into my 30s and I had been sort of worn down by the battles of dealing with the anxiety and depression for years and years and years, and, you know, I had put my life together, thought I had everything together only to see it fall apart, I finally decided, well, maybe, okay, there's this one thing that I haven't addressed or dealt with, it was the sexual abuse thing, and maybe maybe this has something to do with why I still struggle so much. And when I finally started reaching out and looking for resources, there were two things that really jumped out at me. First, this was about 2007 when I first started looking. There really was almost nothing out there. There were very, very few books for male survivors. There were a couple. There were very few organizations, very few resources, and very few therapists that seemed to really understand or know anything about what it meant to be a male survivor of sexual abuse. But there was one organization that I was able to connect with, and that was Male Survivor Online. And that was when I really discovered the second and probably the more important point was that there were many, many other men who had gone through similar experiences to what I had gone through, not just the story of the abuse itself that I had experienced, but the lifetime of struggle and the, the difficulties and the anxieties and the challenges of being able to trust, being able to be connected to other people, especially in intimate relationships. And once I started to see my experience repeated through other people's experiences and stories, that was one of the things that really sort of turned on the light bulb and, you know, a number of light bulbs, one being, hey, tell me, you're not alone. There's other people out there who have gone through what you've gone through, but also hearing these people's stories and learning from them, I started to see that there is a path to healing that's available to us. There's great inequality in terms of the services that are available for me. Um, when I first went to the States uh, to attend the Male Survivor Conference there and then went on to, uh, I wanted to do some talks and um, and conduct some interviews around this, this topic and, you know, every media outlet shut the doors on us when, when we were talking about um, male-on-male sexual abuse and or, or any sexual abuse of men. Uh, one of the things, one of the, um, the walls that I came up against was at the universities where, you know, after some almost coercion, they were happy to hear um, us speak about men, but they insisted that we speak about it in the feminine framework or the feminist framework, which indicated that there was a lot less victims of men and that this was an absolute minority. And, you know, I refused on that level because I, I while I wanted to be heard, uh, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to have to compromise what I was going to say um, be because of, you know, the other point of view. That there's a lot of there's a lot of conflict and a lot of denial there about the volume of men who have been victims of sexual abuse, and um, you know we report on it uh, in different ways. And they, what one of the issues is that they don't ask the right questions of men. You know, many of the much of the research 
that is done uh, is done with a view that only women can be raped. And so therefore a lot of the questions that they ask men about sexual abuse are sort of done in a, in a feminised frame or in a feminine frame that, that doesn't necessarily elicit the right responses. And I think that, you know, this is where... Um, Socially, you know, we have a, a lot to learn about, you know, asking the right questions in order to get um, the appropriate answers and the full answers from men in relation to their experiences. I am very, very much in favour of changing our standard definitions, both within the research uh, and within legal frameworks. And those are two separate, you know, issues and two separate efforts that need to be taken on. Um, but both within the scientific research literature, the social sciences, and within the legal frameworks that we use to uh, adjudicate uh, accusations and, and cases of rape, we need to recognize that the males can be raped both through the traditional sort of idea of um, uh, being the victim of a penetrative act themselves, but also can experience the same degree of harm, uh, both physically in some ways and certainly emotionally, if they are forced against their will to penetrate a victim. And currently, you're correct, the framework, both in the research and in most many of the legal statutes around the country, don't acknowledge that truth. Um, and it's a very, very difficult challenge because, one, it forces people to confront certain stereotypes and understandings that they may not be careful, they may not be comfortable fully contemplating. Um, and it also gets into some tricky political uh, issues within sort of the movement around sexual abuse and sex sexual assault awareness. Um, one of the things, and I've had many discussions with people sort of across the spectrum on this, and one thing that people seem to uh, feel a, a sense of challenge with is there's a lot of, and I'm being careful because I don't want to step on toes or, you know, or, or say something you know, politically incorrect, um, but really our framework for understanding sexual violence comes, comes out of a tremendous amount of work that was originally done in the Violence Against Women movement. So the framework for thinking about and talking about and, and responding to rape is very much based on feminist thought and work that is done to provide critically essential and important support to female survivors of sexual abuse. I think as an unintended consequence of that, however, this idea that a man you know, can be forced to penetrate someone or frankly something um, and that that could be just as severe and significant a violation of their bodily integrity as the as a victim being penetrated herself would be. This has been something that's been a challenging notion for people to accept. Um, and I think we still have a long way to go and a, a lot of discussions that we need to have to, to help people recognize and understand that there's a validity to this concept that being forced to penetrate is as significant and severe uh, a type of sexual crime uh, as a penetrative act would be. Women's, um, women's experiences are seen as being more important to discuss and men's as a minority thing that we might deal with later down the track. And that's, that's simply not acceptable. We have to be able to have conversations, forums, equal funding um, and societal acceptance that these are human conditions. Being a victim is a, is a human condition, being a perpetrator is a human condition and we have, to take, we have to take the gender out of this. So I think it has to happen at a political level um, and it has to happen at a social level and I, I mean my personal feeling is that we need an enormous campaign, an enormous media campaign to bring awareness for, for these issues um, into into mainstream conversations and schools would be a, a fantastic forum for that but here in Australia at the moment they're doing exactly the opposite and and you know I believe it's going to cause the damage to last a lot longer. How is that how does that affect young boys when they're you know sexually abused and raped or raped or both at an early age during their very 
very impressionable years, but formative years still, when they're coming into an adulthood or young adulthood, they're trying to identify themselves, who they are, who, you know, their sexual preferences, and how does that, like, directly affect their behavior later on in life? That's a great question. We know that forming an identity is a fairly complex process, and it really doesn't start until adolescence. You may know from an early age what your, you certainly know what your gender is, what the sex you were born with. Um, you certainly know what race you are a member of or members of. There may be more than one there. A lot of young children, somewhere around age six, seven, have kind of first crushes around first grade. Um, and they may be very explicit in that moment, even about kind of who they want to date and who they want to marry. And as adults, we may look at that as kind of first sign of sexual orientation. And then it often goes away until puberty. And some kids start puberty as early as 10. Some kids don't really hit it till 15, 16. So there's this huge range in there. And as boys go through puberty, their cognitive abilities are also expanding. We get the ability to think in new ways also during puberty. Um, and we can be much more abstract than we used to be at, say, 10 or in elementary school. Um, so we can deal with a big concept like identity in a way that we can't as a young child. So if I'm 12, 14, even 16, and I'm really trying to figure out who I am, and I'm trying to figure out what my sexual orientation is, one of the ways we do that is to, we, is to look back at who we've been sexual with. Now, the majority of kids haven't been molested or abused or raped, so they don't really have a history, so they only focus on who am I attracted to. But if you've been molested or assaulted or raped, then you have this history. Um, and so all of a sudden you are maybe, tr you're, many of these kids, not all of them, are trying to integrate, okay, I have all of these experiences, and at least as an adolescent, I can say that they weren't wanted, that I was enticed, um, whereas as a child, maybe I didn't understand that. But I have this history, say, with a male abuser, but when I think about who I want to date and who I want to be sexual with, it's all about girls, and how do I put all of that together? Um, and again, if they think that they can't separate that, especially if they think that they were in some ways complicit with the abuse or assault or rape, and that makes it really hard to separate what happened to them, then it leads to a lot of questions of, well, I've been with males, but I'm attracted to females, so who am I? What is my orientation? Um, for me, the short answer is always, you know, your sexual orientation is defined by who you choose to be sexual with and who you find yourself attracted with, not something that was done to you as a child um, without adult style permission. Okay, you're you just were raped, right? And, and therefore you're afraid of saying that you were raped because you're afraid of telling people this and that have them think that, oh well then you will become a rapist. Mm-hmm. Yep. And also that is so damaging. Yeah, uh, it very much so. And, you know, it's something that you, you, you know, we hear, you know, kids, this is so, you know, if a kid discloses, sometimes this is something that they can be confused about uh, now. Um, two other sort of pieces that come, sometimes play into this as well. You know, we still live in a very homophobic society. So part of the silence around this is that there are a lot of people who really are scared that, you know, if they've been raped by a man, you know, they don't want to be perceived as gay. And oftentimes, you know, the body responds to, you know, sexual contact, physical contact in ways that are not consciously controlled. So, you know, many rape survivors report ex having experienced some degree of physical pleasure. And that can make things extraordinarily confusing for any survivor. Um, but when we add on to the sort of the experience of male survivors, this homophobic society we live in, 
and, and standards around that, it can really do a number to a person. And we see a lot of men who struggle with questions around sexual identity uh, over the course of their lives as a result of some of those experiences. So as somebody who's publicly acknowledged as a survivor, one of the things that's very true currently is if I wanted to get a job as an elementary school teacher or potentially do work you know, with children in some other environment or volunteer as like a coach or, or work at a church with kids, I would have a lot of challenges overcoming that myth because it's so entrenched. So, you know, I think those are three major contributing factors to the silence that we often see around male sexual victimization. And I really have thought for a long time that they're just, that's something that wasn't talked enough about. And I think, especially for men, kind of the storyline is, shut up, keep your head down, don't talk about the bad stuff that happens to you, nobody wants to hear you whine, nobody wants to hear you complain, you suck it up and get through life. And, and I'm not satisfied with that option. I don't think that's the right option. I think that option hurts a lot of us individually, and I think when you expand that out to society, it creates a lot of toxic stereotypes and standards that really impact and hurt us for all of us, men and women and families and society. I think it's hugely important and it, it, it's a real bugbear of mine when, um, when I see particularly education systems uh, that are, you know, talking about sexual abuse of children and they're really only referring to girls being sexually abused. Um, the, but particularly in the states where you have, um, you know, a, a different, uh, you know, they have the, the, the sports colleges and what have you there where, you know, where there's high volumes of, of men and there's a high volume of, of male sports coaches. And we know uh, that, you know, there's been many cases where there's been perpetrators, a single perpetrator with hundreds of victims uh, over, over their career. And, you know, this, you know, this is something that, you know, if we're not talking about this in a gender neutral frame, we're missing all of those, we're missing all of those children. And, and I mean, here we have, you know, organisations like Scouts or even the churches and the, um, the you know, the, the private boarding schools and what have you, where, you know, boys are equally as, as vulnerable, if not more so, than, than what girls are. Um, with the contributing factors, you know, there's a handful of things that I think play into it. You know, obviously the toxic male stereotypes that are out there certainly are a significant contributing factor without question. Um, you know, I've, I've written about and I've talked about in a number of places, uh, you know, some of these toxic stereotypes that exist, that men always have to be strong, that men can't cry, uh, that men can't show their vulnerability or weakness. Um, and I think addressing those toxic stereotypes and really helping people understand that, you know, a, a man is just as complicated and rich and varied a human as a woman is, you know, is, is a helpful thing for us to talk about more openly. Um, you know, and I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of these toxic ideas and stereotypes that impact and really hurt men that come from a lot of different sources. Um, so I think it is really important that, we do really confront and challenge those stereotypes whenever we hear them, wherever we see them, uh, whenever we can. But that's only one part of what's a very, you know, a very complicated set of factors that I think contribute to the silence around male sexual abuse. It's not just that we have toxic ideas about what you know, males are or can be. We also have to talk about some of the dynamics of and challenges that male survivors themselves face, uh, which in some ways are unique to men who experience sexual abuse. Um, one of the things that we know, if you actually look into the neurobiology of trauma and the experience of many trauma survivors, is you know the way in which our brains experience and process abusive moments is not as straightforward as a lot of people would presume. The brain responds to trauma and abuse in certain ways that can actually, for some people, make it very difficult for them to recall specific memories after the events. Um, and some, and in some ways, when you have prolonged exposure to abuse and trauma, there are some people, you know, whose brains almost literally sort of as a self-defense mechanism block out and shut down a lot of those memories. 
And one of the things that we see, we don't fully understand the dynamics and the reasons why this happens. There are some male survivors who go through a significant portion of their lives with no active memory or recollection of the traumas and the sexual abuse they've endured until someday, sometime later in life. And on average, we know that it's about 20 years for a man who's experienced child sexual abuse to come forward. Some of the men who I've spoken with, their story, I've heard from a number of people who talk about there was a moment when they were an adult, there's suddenly something happened and all of these memories that had been either repressed or blocked out come flooding back. So there's a very significant issue around the actual processing and the, the sort of recollection of traumatic memories that seems to play a role in why there's a lot of men who don't oftentimes talk about their experiences of abuse. From a clinical perspective and also, also from a research perspective, excuse me, um, we see that there are some real differences for young men who are abused or assaulted or raped um, by women versus having that experience than by a man. Um, part of that, again, ties back to our notions of masculinity, including the idea that masculinity really specifies heterosexuality. For guys who were abused, assaulted, molested by women, and especially guys who haven't yet hit puberty, say under 12, one of the things that happens or that might happen or happens for some guys is that they define this as kind of a voluntary sexual experience. And we saw this, uh, I think it was in 2014, from rapper and performer Chris Brown, who gave an interview with The Guardian newspaper out of London and talked about losing his virginity at age eight to a 13-year-old girl. There is no country in the world where an eight-year-old can give permission, give consent for sexual experience. Um, but Chris Brown talked about this as something that was voluntary, that this was great. He was so awesome that at eight, women wanted to have sex with him. Okay. I can understand that. I can understand how Chris Brown would come to this conclusion. But as an adult, as an outside observer, this really sounds a lot like rape. This is a 13-year-old who is much more advanced in so many ways than an 8-year-old assaulting a child. And let's face it, any, any other time we talk about an 8-year-old, we would call him a child. But one of the ways that you can make sense of this, if you're that 8-year-old, is to talk about how hot you are and how well you fit into our notions of what it means to be a man, including the ability to attract, in this case, an older woman, which is desirable when you're eight, um, and how awesome that must indicate you are. What Chris Brown thinks of this today, after seeing all of the people who wrote articles that said, like, no, dude, you were raped, I have no idea. He has not commented on this case again publicly, at least at the time of our filming. Um, but being an eight-year-old and characterizing this rape or this assault as something that indicates how awesome you are, what a stud you are, I think that's one way to kind of defend or incorporate this in what would seem to be a positive way. On the other hand, if you're an eight-year-old boy and you're being molested, assaulted, raped by man, and especially if you think that homosexuality is bad, then you kind of don't have that out that Chris Brown has. You're probably not going to be like, I'm such a stud that even 13-year-old boys want to have sex with me. Another, one other you know, thing that oftentimes contributes is people don't re realize that women and females can rape other people. And oftentimes, if a boy or a man is experiencing sexual coercion or outright sexual violence at the hands of a female perpetrator, their stories oftentimes won't be believed at all. 
So, you know, and that, that goes back to some of the toxic stereotypes of what, about what it means to be a man, but also I think some very mistaken stereotypes about, you know, what it, is, what it means to be a woman. You mentioned the sampled instantly of your book, that there is a fear of being looked at as a homosexual should you be raped by a minor man. Ex explain that topic and, and how does that directly correlate to the stigma of being a man and you know being a, not being able to fight a your, your attacker and so on. Yeah, thank you. This is a, a point that doesn't get a whole lot of attention. When we look at what boys are taught about sexuality and how they're raised to behave, um, we know that there's a lot of pressure on boys to act straight or appear straight. This seems to be kind of lessening through time, at least in, the, in America, in the US, and in some other Western nations, where being a gay male is increasingly accepted. But at the same time, we know that um, daring a guy, to, a presumed straight guy, to kiss another guy is a huge thing, and it's something that he's not likely to do. We know that guys aren't really encouraged to explore their sexuality with other guys. We know that they're encouraged to be promiscuous, that they get points for having lots of female partners, and in certain subcultures, points for having lots of male partners, but we don't expect guys to, say, go off to college and have a same-sex experience the way that we might expect that for girls probably not going to play it that way. Instead, you're going to have, you're most likely going to have that shame and embarrassment and loss that is much more typical of um, young folks who have been assaulted or abused or raped. So we get those differences. What can we do to protect our, our boys? That's a great question. And I think, like, I think that there are a lot of things that we can do to help boys and men. At the societal level, one of the things that we can do, and I think this film is a great example, is to just start talking about the fact that boys and men are sexually assaulted and raped. And in some ways, we just need to get the information out there. There are some people who know they have learned from the media, from their experiences and culture, that approximately one in four women will be sexually assaulted or raped by the time they're into their 20s or in their lifetime, depending on exactly which version of the information you're looking at. But a lot of those same people don't know that the comparable stat for men is one in six. One in six. One in, um, right. And you can also find data that say one in three women and one in four men. Um, so it depends on exactly what definition and time frame you're looking at. For some people, just having that information, knowing that it's somewhere between one in four men, one in four to one in six men, that'll get them moving and get them learning more. Another thing that we can do is that we can start having people tell those stories. I am in my mid 40s. I remember Tina Turner coming out in the mid 80s and saying, this is my story of being abused and assaulted, and now we would even say raped, by my husband, Ike Turner. For me, she is the first prominent woman to come out and say that story, and that's about my age. But we have this long line of women who had media access, who were already established and famous for one reason or another, who came out and said, this is my story, of being assaulted or raped. We don't have that for men. There is no kind of male poster child. Um, and in some ways that's unfortunate because there are a number of prominent men who have come out. Tyler Perry is probably um, the most well known of those, but his story didn't get that much press 
outside of, I think, the black press and the black media. And maybe that's because it's Tyler Perry and he's black and the white media generally doesn't talk about him very much. Um, but we know based on the stats that he is not the only one. The odds are that he is the only man who has some kind of public stature and has gone through this experience are pretty slim with, we're going to talk about one in six. Um, but we haven't had guys coming out. So we need that to happen because we know that those personal stories have a lot of resonance in ways that just the statistics don't have resonance. I think there's a couple of things that need to be addressed. Uh, first, we need to be educated about the fact that there are so many men who have experienced sexual violence at some point in time in their lives. When you look at the most recent data from the United States uh, Centers for Disease Control and Sexual Violence, we see that at least one out of every four males, they estimate, will experience some form of sexual violence across the lifespan. And I think one of the things we also need to understand is rape is only one form of sexual violence. When we look at things from a trauma-informed, survivor-centered perspective, you know, being a victim of rape is, you know, can absolutely be a terrible, horrible thing, and it is one form of sexual violence. There are many, many other questions, and I think it becomes a challenge because we have still cling to some antiquated, outdated notions of what rape actually is um, that makes us not see some of the uh, sexually violent experiences and victimizations that men experience. Um, so I think broadening our understanding that rape is simply one form of sexual violence and that there's a lot of other ways in which people can be made to feel abused and powerless um, through sexualized means is, is important. And understanding that there are so many men, so many more men out there who have experienced these kinds of abusive uh, victimizations uh, is also something that we need to be more educated about. One of the other things that I think is very important to help people realize, recognize and understand is that as we educate people to better understand the scale and scope and prevalence of male sexual victimization, we really have to go out and address and empower more male survivors to understand that they're not alone, that whatever they may have gone through, whatever may have been done to them was not their fault, that it is absolutely possible for every survivor of sexual violence to heal, um, and that it's never too late. Um, and we actually collect those four messages that, you know, every survivor is not alone, it's not their fault, it's possible to heal, and it's never too late. That's something that we've, you know, sort of pulled together and call those sort of our, our seeds of hope. Um, and when we talk about, you know, the work of healing from trauma and abuse, I think those are four really key important messages that people need to hear over and over and over again. Um, and it is kind of like planting seeds of healing uh, for survivors. One of the things that we can do at the family level, as parents or even as extended family members, is talk to boys not just about not raping girls, but also about the fact that boys do or can sexually assault and rape each other. We can make this part of our conversation about hazing because we know that part of the hazing that boys go through when they join teams and other kind of tightly knit organizations in many cases involves some kind of sexual component. And we can talk about, you know, this, that's one of the places where this happens. We can also talk to boys about the fact that they can say no that if someone they're attracted to or someone who is generally considered hot and therefore is of high status, propositions them sexually, that if they don't want to do it, they should say no. Same conversation that we have with girls and we would automatically have with our daughters. We need to have that with our son because the message that guys get from our culture, from our perceptions of manhood, is that guys should always want sex, that they should pretty much never say no. And they need to hear it from us that 
our values are taking care of yourself, being true to yourself, and if that means turning down sex, then you turn down sex. And so they also need to be taught how to say no. We need to, when we are talking to our boys about saying no, we need to be clear that um, people of, all, of any gender might be doing things that are assault or rape. It could be other boys, it could be girls, it could be adult women or men, uh, whoever it might be, um, might be doing something that is inappropriate and they need to say no regardless of who that is. I think one other thing that we can do that would really help address, you know, how we can better help survivors is just to get a better understanding of what the actual dynamics of being a survivor of trauma and abuse are. Um, and I think that requires us to have a better understanding of the neurobiology of trauma, which is one of the reasons why I read up a lot about it and try to help incorporate that into the work I do as a speaker and as a trainer, um, but also help professionals in any field, whether it's mental health, you know, law enforcement, really any, any kind of area where you're going to interact with human beings on a regular basis, understand that there are so many victims of abuse and trauma out there who really don't do a very good job knowing how we can craft, you know, or how we can do a better job just as random people responding to disclosures of abuse and trauma that we may, you know, that we may receive, you know, on any given day. Um, but everybody at some point in time hears a disclosure of trauma and abuse from somebody. Everybody's got a story. Nobody gets to 30 unscathed in this world. Right. But I don't think we have a very good way of processing or handling or talking about it. You know, people get trained in CPR, but we don't do a good enough job training people how to respond to disclosures of abuse. And honestly, I really sincerely believe that a compassionate response to a disclosure of trauma or abuse can be just as life-saving and important as providing CPR is to a person who's choking. It, it's just not part of the conversation that boys are um, vulnerable to, to perpetrators. We will, they'll, they'll talk freely about about girls being um, potential victims to to male perpetrators, but they're not discussing enough that uh, that you know boys are equally vulnerable. So I think feminists have the answers here, but they are also the problem. There is an extreme faction of um, of feminism that will absolutely deny that uh, that you know men are worthy of services, and and they are the ones who are blocking at every turn um, for us to speak about men's issues. Now, I identify these as extreme factions, but these are extreme and they are everywhere in our universities, in our political systems, um, and often in our legal systems as well. They're not a minority um, in, in as much as it's only a few, you know, kind of out there women sitting somewhere behind a keyboard. Um, that's far from the truth. This has permeated through all of our political and, and social systems in a way that it, it's sort of, um, it's very much a top-down approach. So I think, I think the answers lay within, um, within women to, you know, mainstream women. Most people don't identify with or without feminism. You know, that's, it, most people, I think, in reality, don't even really think about it, um, especially in Western cultures. Um, but it's up to women to, to rise up and, and say and, and to speak out against them and, and to say, you know, yes, we, we're entitled to our rights, but our rights should not take away from men's rights. And that's certainly where, um, where I stand and, and where I sit on this issue. My rights as a woman should not take away the rights of any other person um, and not man, woman or child. It's important to acknowledge the things that we do get right. And I think we are moving in the right direction in a number of areas when it comes to understanding, you know, the importance of gender equality around a number of issues. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's, we tend to have a negative bias, you know, as human beings, we're always looking out for the things that are wrong. Um, and I think, it, you know, it is true that we've made a lot of progress, not enough, um, on gender equality issues in a lot of spheres, uh, in a lot of areas of life. Um, 
that said, when it comes to, you know, again, I think a lot is dependent on the frame or the lens that you view a lot of these challenges and these questions, you know, through. And I want to be very clear, you know, and part of the reason why I wanted to start by acknowledging that we've made a lot of progress, and a lot of that progress is thanks to, by and large, the tremendous efforts and sacrifices that have been made by tons of, you know, people who have fought in the uh, sort of gender, I don't want to hate using I don't want to say gender wars, but the violence against women movement and these equality issues, the feminist movements, have done a tremendous amount to, you know, raise awareness and, and really create better resources around a lot of these issues. Um, and as a male survivor, I openly acknowledge my debt to a lot of that work and that, that was done decades ago to raise awareness of sexual violence and to start creating better resources and start creating a dialogue around these issues. All of that said, I think that a lot of that work has unintentionally put men into a kind of box where oftentimes we are stereotyped as the source of the problem or patriarchy is the source of the problem. And instead of identifying very specifically what parts of masculinity or patriarchy are the problem, there's been sort of a shift to thinking, well, it's just men in general or masculinity in general that's the issue. And I think that's a very, I think that's had very, very harmful consequences. And again, I think to some extent, you know, unintended ones. Um, but it's created this framework of viewing men and males and masculinity largely with a, a tremendous amount of skepticism. Um, and let me be clear, you know, in trying to talk about this, it, it's difficult because you get into some very challenging issues around gender politics. And I want to be very clear, I'm not a men's rights activist. I don't identify with that movement. I think a lot of people who are very vocal and have gotten a lot of attention in that, you know, sort of movement, you know, they speak as sort of a reaction against a lot of these unintended harmful consequences, as I would portray them, um, of a lot of that, you know, work around violence against women. And the fact of the matter is, I think it's absolutely possible and critical for people to advocate for the experiences of men who have been victimized, been abused, who are victims of sexual violence and domestic violence. We have to acknowledge that we exist, that we're out here, and we have to do so in a way that doesn't alienate or, you know, uh, bash out, you know, or, or label people who are doing great work in other areas as, uh, you know, as terrible, horrible, toxic people. You know, there's elements of toxic masculinity that absolutely do need to be called out. And I think there's elements of toxic femininity that, you know, should be recognized and called out. You know, it's, it's overly simplistic to say, oh, well, you know, here's, here's, it's all about patriarchy. It's all about masculinity. Um, that doesn't, really help us create better solutions to acknowledge the lived reality of any given victim. We just, we need to be a bit braver. You know, we need, society needs to be more brave and be prepared to have more deep level conversations and to address these as human issues, not, not gender issues. You know, both both men and women can be victims and both men and women can be perpetrators. And that's something that we just, at this point, aren't really prepared to accept. 